I now welcome Mr John Adams of Adams Economics. Thank you for appearing before the committee today. You, I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should state the grounds upon which the objection is taken and the committee will determine whether it will insist on an answer. If the committee determines to insist on an answer, a witness may request that the answer be given in camera. Such a request may also be made at any other time. Just note the question on notice date again of uh, 3 February 2020. Uh, for the Hansard record, could you please state your full name and capacity in which you appear? John Adams, Principal Economic Analyst, Adams Economics. Great. Welcome along. Uh, do you wish to make an opening statement, Mr Adams? Yes, Senator. I, I was going to say, before I do, I should note that um, I have brought a, uh, a pack of, of documents and uh, you've got a pack and the rest of the pack of the Senators are there at that table, so these are consistent with the instructions that the Secretary gave me. Yeah, no, that's fine. And we will, um, assuming nobody has any objections, we will accept them. I will ask you to send them through to the Secretariat in electronic version. Okay. Um, no so, uh, obviously, that's a decent pile of papers. Yes. And we, we accept you followed instructions, but um, we would ask you to send them through electronically as well. No problem, Senator. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Okay. So, um, Okay, um, so I'm just going to go to my opening statement. So um, there are four primary reasons why I oppose the government's $10,000 cash payment limit. So number one, the proposed legislation strikes a fundamental blow to economic freedom in Australia. Two, the proposed legislation will not achieve the government's stated pol public policy objectives. Three, the Black Economy Task Force and the government have made a series of claims without supporting robust empirical evidence. Four, the proposed legislation is an attempt to entrap Australians into the banking system, which is both uh, anti-competitive and unfair. This entrapment is concerning given the prospect of the Reserve Bank of Australia introducing unconventional monetary policy, in particular negative nominal interest rates. So let me address each of these points in detail. So point one, economic freedom. The proposed legislation would place significant restrictions on Australians determining their economic affairs and would strike a fundamental blow to the freedom to conduct uh, legal commercial transactions without being tracked by either the government or the banking system. It is for these reasons Germany rejected the introduction of a cash payment limit in 2016 when it was proposed by their government. Moreover, the phenomena of debanking, uh, which was uh, sort of uh, mentioned at the last public hearing, uh, also means that the proposed law may result in the closure of legitimate legal businesses who are denied uh, access to banking services. Uh, the other point I'll make is, as we heard from the last witness, the, regula the, the, the potential regulatory cost uh, that this proposed law would, would uh, impose on corporations in the economy would be significant. Uh, and I would argue it would be inconsistent with the government's uh, deregulation agenda. Uh, so point two, uh, failure to achieve public policy objectives. The bill seeks to achieve two broad objectives, reducing tax evasion as well as reducing other uh, black economy activity, including money laundering. On the tax evasion question, evidence provided uh, by the Austrian National Bank via a 2017 European Policy Studies report suggests that a cash payment limit did not assist uh, uh, in reducing tax evasion in, in Austria. Alternatively, evidence from other European countries suggests that a cash payment limit of $10,000 is too high to make a material impact on tax evasion facilitated by cash transactions. On the black economy and money laundering question, evidence from the leading European black economy researcher, Professor Friedrich Schneider from the University of Linz, Austria, is that there is weak empirical evidence that the cash payment limit policies actually reduce the black economy. Moreover, evidence from Austrac to this inquiry um, is that the, the proposed law may assist in addressing the money laundering risk involved, involving high value dealers such as jewellers, uh, art and collectible dealers. Mm. However, analysis by the OECD suggests that real estate transactions are the greatest risk of money laundering in Australia, especially um, um, uh, funds coming from, from China. And yet the Parliament has refused to act on recommendations from the OECD to address this risk. Therefore, the proposed law will not address the most significant risks of money laundering in Australia. So point three, lack of empirical evidence. Uh, as highlighted at the uh, 12 December uh, public hearing, the 10,000 th uh, threshold by the government was artificially invented by the Black Economy Task Force and was not based on any empirical or statistical analysis. The government has uh, no idea what impact the law would have on compliance uh, with, these, uh, with Australia's tax system 
and has no idea how much revenue may be generated. And this is a point that was made in the bill's explanatory memorandum. If tax leakage is such a pressing problem for the government, data from the Australian Tax Office suggests that the most obvious source of untapped tax revenue is the one-third of large corporations operating in Australia that pay no tax, including foreign multinationals. On the, on the question of money laundering, there is no robust evidence as to how much money laundering, if any, is conducted by so-called high-value dealers and how the proposed law may reduce or address this risk. Rather, as, uh, sorry, rather um, um, because of what I just said, the evidence suggests that, uh, the real uh, that real estate transactions is the greatest source of money laundering risk in Australia. Uh, point four, uh, unconventional monetary policy. Uh, there's an abundance of documentary evidence that the International Monetary Fund and other central bank forums, such as the in, uh, International Centre for Monetary and Banking Studies, have called for physical cash to be severely restricted or even eliminated in order to facilitate the effective impl implementation of negative nominal interest rates. These institutions constitute the coordinated global policy effort, which some, including myself, have referred to the you know referred to as the international war on cash. On page 48 of the Black Economy Task Force final report, there's a reference to the writings and commentary of former IMF Chief Economist Ken Rogoff that moving away from cash could enhance the effectiveness of monetary policy. Ken Rogoff is a leading global advocate of introducing negative nominal interest rates and has argued reducing the availability of cash ahead of the next global recession um, can, enhance, uh, you know, can enhance negative rates in stimulating economic activity. Hence, by virtue of the Black Economy Task Force final report and the technical papers of the IMF and, and other central bank forums, there is no doubt, um, um, and it is not a conspiracy theory, that the proposed law would push Australians into the banking system ahead of negative nominal interest rates becoming a reality in Australia. So in conclusion, uh, this committee should adopt the same standards set by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd about the need for evidence-based policy. The burden that justifies this Sorry, the burden that justifies this legislation rests with the government, and in my view, view the government has failed this test. Thank you. Order. All right, we'll get to questions. Would you like to kick off, Senator McAllister? Sure. Thanks very much for your submission and for taking your time to appear as a witness, Mr Adams. Uh, you mentioned in your uh, remarks just now, the phenomenon of debanking, and I don't think that that's discussed in your written submission. What are you referring to? Uh, so, so, so the issue of debanking, um, so that was discussed quite, um, um, that was, um, um, there was a lot of discussion about that at the last hearing on the 12th of December. So witnesses at that hearing um, talked about certain legal businesses that were denied banking services um, because of uh, the banks just didn't want to do business with them. Um, so, so there was examples of, of um, you know, tattoo parlours, pubs, um, uh, and uh, uh, there are corporations that, that provide uh, vaping services, etc. And in those instances, the banks basically said, we're not going to give you access to a bank account, we're not going to give you access to an FBOS machine, whatever the case may be. And so the evidence from the last hearing was that if you can't have access to banking services, um, and, and this law comes in, you can't do business. And basically, this law would put a lot of legal businesses out of, you know, basically out of work. Uh, thank you. Um, the, uh, you are not alone in raising the issue of uh, negative nominal interest rates. Um, I suppose the question I have for you is, given that the legislation that's actually before us, notwithstanding your views about what various economists or international um, commentators may wish to happen, then the legislation before us would allow um, a continuing right to hold and store value in cash. You could uh, take as much money out of the bank as you wanted to and store it, and you could put as much cash in as, as you wanted to at any time. Um, I'm, I do struggle to see how this um, this connection between negative nominal interest rates and um, uh, and, the, and the actual measures proposed here sure. is made. Sure. Okay. So, so, so what I would say on that particular point, so, so there's probably two or three points to make. So, um, you know, it has been proposed uh, by certain media organisations that there's the, the, that the that there's no agenda to eliminate cash uh, in terms of in terms of the across Australia and across the world. Sorry. So. Just for clarity, who do you believe has proposed that? What, what that, that, that 
Sorry, can, can you, you said just... it has been proposed by certain media organisations, yeah, and I wanted yeah, to know who you. Sure. So, who so you the Australian identify. Financial Review wrote an article right. about my commentary on this particular legislation, um, and suggested I was involved in the conspiracy theory. So, so part of the reason why I brought all these documents is to demonstrate that there is um, a whole host of international documentation, and again, it's referred to in the Black Economy Task Force that th that there's a move by the Morrison government to reduce or eliminate cash in in the Australian economy that would actually enhance monetary policy. So the question is, what well, you know, what are they wanting to enhance? Uh, how would this be more effective? It's around negative interest rates. So so the question then becomes is, well, how how does this specific law, um, you know, um, impact? that particular question. So, so I would argue in a couple of ways. The first one is, is that if negative interest rates were to come in, um, and, and so, you know, so, you know, whether, and it was in my supplementary submission, so we, we have seen at least one bank so far in Germany where it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, you will charge, you will be paid a fee to, um, to hold money in the bank. So if you withdraw your money out of the bank to hold it, then if you do want to engage in a transaction above 10,000, you must go to the banking system and you're going to be in charge in certain fee. So, so, so that fee, whatever the case may be, I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, that could be quite significant. So the other point I would make is that I have heard quite a few stories across, the, across Australia in the last four months. It is getting increasingly more difficult for Australians to withdraw large volumes of cash out of the banking system. So, and I'm happy to give you a couple of examples. So, one example is so uh, one of the things I do separate to uh, consulting is I, I'm involved in the gold and silver business. We had one client, uh, 80, 80 years old, wanted to buy $900,000 worth of precious metals. Um, uh, our company policy that I work for uh, uh, was that they had to provide a, a, a deposit of, of $100,000. And then they had to pay the, the balance when when the goods were delivered. So they they, they go to the bank, get the hundred thousand, and they and they give it to the company. They go back to the bank and say, okay, we, we want to withdraw eight hundred thousand dollars, which is the balance of our account. The the manager of the branch basically said that um, he has a duty of care to ensure that this eight year old Australian knows what he's doing, and he made the determination that he didn't know what he was doing, and basically said, we're not going to give you your money. Um, so, so basically, so this an 80-year-old basically was told by the by the bank, you will not have access to your money, and therefore, you know, uh, you, you know, you have to leave now. So three months on, he still can't get access to his money. He's, he's had lawyers involved. He's gone to a whole host of other people. So, so, so there are clear examples, and, and there are people who have done at twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars. I mean, banks are putting um, more restrictions and making it harder for people to 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 withdraw money out of the banking system. So. People could have money in the bank, a negative interest rate come in, and then you want to try to get money in the bank. It, it, you know, so, so, I mean, it is becoming harder to, to actually, uh, you know, in terms of getting money out. And then if you get it out, well, how can you use it in such a way that, that, it, that it's legal and you're not going to be basically tracked by the government or in terms of the banking system? So the other point is, and, and, and obviously it, with the first witness that came today, Senator Patrick referred to the rules. So uh, under the rules, there is an exemption. So, and this is the, um, so, so the section eight of the rules basically makes it exempt that if you are um, reporting under the anti-money laundering law, um, you are exempt from this law. Now, who, who, who does that cover? That covers the banks. So uh, as the rules are stated now, if you have money in the bank, you can still deposit, you can still withdraw, and that's legal. But it's an exemption. And, and if that exemption is removed by the assistant treasurer, then it, it actually becomes illegal to actually withdraw or deposit money in the bank. Um, so, 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 so if I may stop you sure. there for clarity, Mr Adams, your objection um, that you're stating here in this third point is not the exemption, but the fact that it is contained in subordinate legislation, not in the primary legislation. Well, yeah, so, so I'll, and I'll provides I'll, significant discretion to the government of the day. Yeah, yes. So, 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 the, so obviously you'd be aware that the, the, the scrutiny of the bills committee basically said that these exemptions should be in the primary legislation, not in not in the rules. But, but technically speaking, the bill itself says that all transactions in Australia above ten thousand can't be done in cash, and then there are certain exemptions. So, if you pass the legislation in, in, um, um, and exclude the rules, taking money in the bank is illegal, basically in cash. 
but, but then, and, and then obviously, and so obviously one of the big concerns is if we did have some sort of financial crisis, if we did have some sort of run on the banks, um, and if you look at, for example, um, you know, you've got massive capital controls in Lebanon now, you've had cap massive capital controls in Greece in 2012, uh, uh, and in terms of Cyprus as well. If we did have a severe financial crisis, uh, one of the big concerns is, is that this law, if the exemption is removed, Section 8 of the rules, uh, basically, you can't take money in the bank. So, so that's a direct consequence of, of this legislation. But on, on, on sorry, the just to stop you there, I mean, we might as well just—you've got a lot of ideas, so we might as well explore them in an orderly way. But your proposition is a fear that in the event of a financial crisis, a government might use the latitude inherent in the legislation before us to intervene in ways that you don't agree with in the economy. Is that? Uh, I'm not. Well, what, what I'm saying is that that legal avenue is possible. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably all for me, Chair. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, I was interested in your submission. Uh, you question the uh, the um, uh, efficacy of the government's underlying economics in terms of suggesting that the black economy is growing. Can you just elaborate on that, please? Sure. So, so the Black Economy Task Force uh, came to the view that the that the black economy um, in Australia over the last few years it has been increasing. Now the leading international um, expert on the black economy, Professor Schneider from from Austria, he has and, and 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 so one of the papers that's in the pack is actually his analysis, which was published at the International Monetary Fund, is to suggest that over the last 20 to 25 years the the black economy has actually been shrinking in Australia. It has not been growing. So we have Australian. Uh, Australian task force saying it's growing. The internet, one of the leading international experts, say no. The black economy in Australia, you know, it is actually, it is actually shrinking. And if you go to the size of the black economy in 2015, according to uh, Professor Schneider's estimates, the Australian black economy it was the fifth smallest in the uh, basically in the OECD. So, 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 so clarify: Does Professor Schneider say it's shrinking as a percentage of the economy, or shrinking, shrinking in absolute terms? Uh, like a, in terms of GDP, so yeah, so yeah, so so so, so, so yeah, so on this fundamental premise, there's a, there's a there's a dispute in terms of well, what's really happening with the black economy. Is it getting worse or is it actually you know getting better over time? And, and you know, obviously, one of the points I would make is is that when uh, Peter Costello was treasurer and they introduced the GST, one one of the propositions was that GST would reduce the black economy. Um, so, 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 and, and you know, it's fair to say that whether it's been under Labor or the coalition, there's been a series of measures to ad address the black economy over the last 20 years. And so, um, you know, it would make sense to me that the black economy has been shrinking, particularly because we've seen a transition away from um, cash payments to the digital economy. And, and this is obviously, you know, the evidence of the Treasury and the RBA. So we have seen the shift. And if we've seen the shift, it would make sense, particularly because of the um, anti-money laundering requirements by the reporting requirements by the banks. We would see a shrink in, in terms of the size of the black economy. Okay. Um uh, sticking with the theme on the black economy, you say that there are two objectives that the government is seeking mm -hmm. from this bill. One is to uh, look at tax evasion and the other to look at the uh, black economy. So that's you know, just the way in which the black economy uses cash transactions to conduct business. And I, I just wonder, in introducing these laws, these people that are acting unlawfully probably won't be persuaded by this new law anyway? No. no, no the so the definition of a criminal is someone who doesn't follow the law. So if you're not going to follow the law, why would you follow it this time? I was just looking at uh, one of the exemptions uh, uh, in, in the rules are a payment solely made as a gift. Aren't all black economy payments gifts? You know, I just... <laughs> Potentially. Yeah, you know, just... Um, it really goes to the effectiveness of, of whether or not this, um, th this bill will achieve uh, those particular aims, and I wonder, uh, in your view, is there enough evidence, is there any evidence that, strong evidence that says this will, this will cause um, uh, a, a change in the conduct in the black economy? No, no, the thing is, is that the, 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 um, the, the government, in my view, hasn't provided enough evidence 
to convince me that, that this will actually address those two primary objectives on tax evasion and in terms of money laundering. And so um, obviously this European Policy Studies report, and, and it's interesting, when the Uniting Church testified on the 12th of December, I mean, they cherry-picked their quotes, but there is definitely a quote in this report, which is in this pack, where the Austrians have said, we have a high volume of cash transactions in our economy, and, the, and, and this cash payment limit, which is which in Austria is, is lower than ten thousand euros, uh, it didn't actually have it did, didn't actually help in terms of tax evasion. Um, and, and the other point I'll probably make is when you look at the testimony from the Law Council of Australia, it's very hard to secure a, a criminal prosecution in, in terms of the law. So, so, so yes, yeah, so on, on the tax question, um, I mean, yeah, the international experts. So, so again. I don't want to be here today making claims. I want to present the best evidence that I've come across that, that, that says to me that, that just, you won't achieve that. It just says, um, in your statement, you said that the government hasn't uh, provided any convincing evidence. Correct. Um, but but is, is there other evidence available um, outside of government that suggests that this would be effective? No, no. The thing is, is that, so the Austrians said didn't help. Uh, I mean, there are some governments in Europe who have said that, that this potentially could help, but if it's going to help, it's got to be way lower than... than, than How than, many than, countries than, has this sort of legislation been implemented in? Oh, the thing is, look, at, so, so I think if you look at the European Policy Studies Report, I mean, I can't, I don't know off the top of my head, at least 15 to 20 countries in Europe have, have actually implemented And this. is there any empirical data uh, from those jurisdictions that uh, say this is what happened before? And this is what happened after. No, no. So, so, so one of the quotes from Professor Snyder is, is that there is, quote, weak empirical evidence that, that this will actually, uh, you know, deal with tax evasion of all of the black economy. So, um, so, so if Professor Snyder, who's, uh, who's been writing uh, leading papers on this, can't see the evidence, I would suggest there's not a convincing catalogue of evidence that would prove that, that by implementing this, the government will actually achieve the objectives that the legislation says it's going to achieve. So you, you say little, uh, little positive outcome for the government. Uh, in, we clearly understand there's an imposition for, for businesses, mm -hmm. and indeed, as you, you state, there's a restriction on the freedom of, of people to act lawfully within the economy um, created by this bill. That would be your summary, that the, 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 the benefits are highly questionable and the disadvantages are not questionable. Correct. Okay, thank you. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your time today, Mr. Adams. Could I ask you just to expand on the point in your first submission that uh, revolved around the real estate industry and the tackling of the black market economy in that, sure. which isn't being addressed? Sure. So, so in the pack, there is a report from the OECD. So, so the OECD um, has said that one of the greatest risks, and so there have been other voices in Australia who has also made this point, that one of the greatest risks of money laundering um, in Australia is actually in terms of real estate. So, um, so, so, so I would say that this is an important point on two fronts. One is Austrac's testimony on the 12th of December was that this law will not actually address real estate transactions. This law will actually focus on high value dealers. And so one of the frustrations of the OECD and, and, and a whole host of, of, of other stakeholders across Australia is that whether it's the, the ALP or whether it's the coalition, neither government has actually gone to the step of expanding the anti-money laundering reporting framework to include real estate agents, lawyers and accountants. So, um, so the greatest risk of, of money laundering, um, there, is, there is a way forward that the OECD and others have suggested to address that risk. This law is not that way. The, the way they have suggested is to expand the anti-money laundering framework. And so when I was looking at the Parliament House website last year, there is a law, and I don't think it's passed yet, there is a law that uh, I think Minister Dudden introduced, which was to, ex uh, which was to actually reform the anti-money laundering regime. And real estate agents in particular were not captured under that proposed law by the government. So, so I would argue is that um, if, if the parliament is serious around money laundering, the OECD has, has provided a pathway forward and both sides of politics uh, of the major parties have not actually done anything to address that particular risk. Just so, just so I'm clear, this is the paper implementing the OECD anti-bribery convention right. phase four report? Yeah, it is the report, yes. Okay, thank you. You also listed a number of key concerns. 
and one of them was um, around the government seeking to infringe on the rights of individual Australians. Um, are you aware that the Victorian Liberal State Council earlier this week overwhelmed, 95 per cent supported opposing this legislation? The person who moved the motion is sitting in the gallery today. Um, well, I've got a copy you're, of the... You're quoting the Liberal Party. I, I've got a so copy of the resolution and you, I'm you happy to read to it. <laughs> I'm happy to read it. You should listen to the So, more. that this State Council calls on the Federal Government to reaffirm its commitment to individual freedom and free enterprise by withdrawing the currency restrictions on the use of cash bill 2019. The Federal Government has announced that it will introduce a bill, currency restrictions on the use of cash bill 2019, to ban cash transactions between entities above an arbitrary threshold of $10,000, which can be changed if or when required. Banning cash is an illiberal policy that erodes civil liberties and conflicts with our party's fundamental principles of individual freedom and free enterprise. The legislation forces people into private banks to transact, purportedly to curb crime, which is a state issue. This bill will actually expose individuals to prosecution and other objectionable government policy, including negative interest rates and deposit bail-in. And they've, they've noted that the federal minister responsible is the treasurer. I understand both the treasurer and the assistant treasurer were present at the state council, um, but didn't remain for the vote. Um, but it was 95. It was passed by 95 per cent. Yes, yeah. so, so I personally was not there, but the person who moved the motion is sitting in the gallery today, so I'm fully aware of that issue. The other point I would make, and, and, and perhaps Senator Patrick and, and you and Senator McAllister would not know, is I am actually a former coalition Senate no, advisor. I think that's in the Aaron Patrick article. Yes, yes. yes. So, so, I, yeah, so, so when Senator Brockman was working as an advisor, I was working as an advisor in 2012-13, and uh, what I would say is, um, you know, and, and it's very interesting in terms of the last, um, uh, in terms of the last witness. So, so my role when I was a coalition advisor was working on the coalition's deregulation policy. So, when the Rudd government uh, implemented a deregulation agenda, I was working as a Commonwealth public servant in the Department of Finance, working on deregulation um, um, as, a, as a bureaucrat. And then I had the opportunity to, to go help the coalition formulate a policy. And, and you know, what I would say is, is that this policy is completely inconsistent with the thinking um, in terms of how to deregulate an economy and to actually to promote not only economic freedom, but in terms of in terms of sort of you know robust economic outcomes. So. so cost of business, it appears, as well. Of, of course, absolutely. And, and, and Senator Patrick, what I would say on that is, is that um, I find it interesting that the government hasn't published a regulatory impact statement about this particular law because, uh, you know, it, it's very interesting with the last witness. Um, they can't quantify the cost, and the cost is quite significant. And I would say that, you know, the, the Black Economy Task Force wasn't necessarily thinking that travel agents were a big source of, of black economy activity. So, so the fact that there is no regulatory impact statement, I, I, again, I, I, my view is the government hasn't done its homework on this. They've come, they've come up with a bit of a rush law, quite ill-considered, a um, lot of negative impacts, not a lot of benefits. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the government is trying to push this through. Um, and, and, you know, one, one of the risks is, so there's quite a few Australians who are aware of this law. There's a lot of there's millions of Australians who have no idea that the parliament's considering this law, and so uh, if this law does pass, and millions of Australians do find out that this is now the law, uh, I would say that the economic but also the political repercussions of this would be more significant than what that potentially parliament is, is thinking at the moment. I think one of the attendees at the. Victorian Liberal Council meeting said, I have a simple message for the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer, get out of my wallet. <laughs> and do you think... I think we do need to return to the bill, please, Senator Kitchen. Well, I think it's, it's... Well, I think that it's interesting philosophically about why a party that purports to stand for um, individual freedoms would impose something on... Australians, which basically is around legal tender, and I was going to ask Mr Adams if he could very briefly give um, a philosophical um, sure. response sure, to sure, sir, sir. Uh, why, why he, and I think you've partly answered that in your last response. Sure, sure. I mean, look, so I've, I've said it on the public record previously, happy to say it again. So um, at the time I worked for Senator Sinodinus in 2012-13, I was a member of the Liberal Party. In 2016, I quit the Liberal Party. One of the reasons why I've quit the Liberal Party is because um, I hold a set of philosophical beliefs. 
uh, I, my view is, is that the coalition has walked away from the, in, ter in terms of those core beliefs. And so I think the vote at the Victorian State Liberal Council was a reflection of their distress that the, that the cabinet and some of these ministers are pursuing policies for particular vested interests. And, and so, so I would say that particularly the banking system, the banking industry will, uh, are very supportive of this particular measure. Um, and so <coughs> when the coalition is pushing the interests of certain industries and not holding firm to their core foundational beliefs, that's causing significant distress in the Liberal Party. Um, and it's actually one of the core reasons why I decided to walk away from the Liberal Party. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Is this a supplementary? Yeah. That's fine. Um, you mentioned no regulatory impact statement being a bureaucrat. Uh, what's the threshold for uh, um, for, for making a, a regulatory impact statement, or rather, why would it, why would this have been carved out well, in that respect? No, no. no the thing is, is that so, so my, my okay. So so when I worked in the Department of Finance in two thousand eight, nine, ten. Um, I mean, I think under the Labor government, I mean, it was only, um, you know, so anything that was of material nature had to have a regulatory impact statement. Now, at the time, Treasury um, had a very poor compliance record. Now, I would argue that this law has a huge regulatory impact, um, that Treasury should have produced a regulatory impact statement, and if they haven't, I suspect they haven't complied with the government's own regulatory. Uh, re uh, so, well, in the question I'll ask them. I just wondering if you'd point me to the to the right place that uh, which sets the threshold for it, such that so, I, so, I can so, ask yes, them that question. Yes, so, so, so I'm happy to take that on notice um, and, and, and come back to you with a yeah, response. If, if you don't know, that's fine. So, what do you think about the general proposition that cash is a declining part of the economy anyway, and people are people are voting with their behaviour? So, so. That I mean, you know, um, I'm glad you asked that question, Senator, because I think that's one of the core questions. So, um, we are seeing, um, and, and so this is consistent with the evidence from the RBA and Treasury. We've seen over the last decade a movement away from cash. Uh, although you know that movement away from cash isn't particularly universal. I mean, there are other particularly um, places in Europe where cash is still being heavily used. Germany, 60% of transactions are still in cash. Um, in, in terms of Austria, high, high level of cash tra um, usage as well. Is My that cultural or regulatory? Um, uh, no, no. Look, so, so, so I think the evidence from from the European Policy Study report is that, that 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 is cultural. So one of the concerns I have is is that when negative interest rates do come into Australia, we're going to see a reversal in the trend on the demand for cash. So we're, we're going to see the demand for physical cash go up. And so, so the government's proposition on this law is that the demand for physical cash going forward is going to go down once negative interest rates go come in, and I'm convinced they will. Um, the demand for cash will go up, and why? Because people are not going to want to pay the impost for, uh, that, that they will have to pay if they keep their money in, ter in, in terms of the bank. And so, you know, one of the key points is is that the IMF, and this is again in these papers that they've said that um, if we have a recession or a financial crisis, etc. Uh, we will have to, you know, to stabilise the economy, interest rates will have to be cut between 3 to 6%. So interest rates, uh, official policy rates at the moment is 0.75. So so if the IMF is saying we have you have to cut between 3 to 6, well, where's interest rates going to go? We're talking anywhere between negative 2 to negative 5. And so this is one of the papers that the IMF uh, published last year, is to suggest that, that, that interest rates um, are likely to go in the next recession anywhere between negative two to negative five. Now, if that was the case, ordinary Australians will have to pay, uh, will have to give up a certain proportion of their deposits to the, to the banks because interest rates, how it works is, negative interest rates, the, the central bank imposes a negative charge on reserves held by the, the commercial banks. The, the commercial banks deposit a portion of the reserves into the central bank. The central bank charges those reserves with, with a negative interest rate charge. The banks then have to make up a cost, and so far, uh, it, particularly in Denmark and Germany, they are charging customers with that. So if, if policy rates went, went severely negative, um, you're going to see a whole bunch of Australians say, oh, I don't want to pay this to the banks, I want to take my money out of the banks. Physical, the demand for physical cash go up, and then this law is going to trap these people because once this law comes in, then it's like you may have $100,000, but you are limited in terms of what you can actually do with that money. So, uh, so, so, so that's a, a key uh, point that the committee has to consider is, you know, you can look at what the demand for cash is today, but what is the kind of ca demand for, ca for cash going to be in the next two or three years? It, it, the, the, it, you know, it's going to actually be higher because of these negative interest rates. 
All righty. There being no further questions, Mr Adams, we thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. And on that... And on that basis, we will uh, suspend until 11.15.